Hey, Mike Callahan here. I want to make a quick video um, on the Facebook groups, both industries actually, lawn care and uh, home cleaning. The biggest question right now that's circling around in a lot of the groups is, is it better to be a solo operator? You run the business yourself as the only technician. You run the sales, the marketing, the lawn care, the cleaning in the field, and take care of everything. And is that uh, a better option because there's less stress, you have a better work-life balance, and the profitability of the company is going to be higher? Um, or is it basically where is that sweet spot to scale a business if you don't want to be a solar operator? When do you get the economies of scale and when do you actually start seeing the benefits of all the hard work and maybe some of the stress of building that team changes. So I'm going to break it down. There's really four or five stages of a business. And the first stage of a business is it's broken in, in basically 1A and 1B. And that's really uh, the, the 1A is someone who is traditionally working for a company, but they're basically like, you know, I want to start my own thing. The person I'm working for is getting rich off my hard work. So they're starting it part-time. That's a stage 1A. Stage B is basically when you've said, I'm done. I'm not working for the man. I'm leaving this business and starting my own business because it's going to be more profitable. And I'm going to have more control over my destiny, which we all find out eventually is not really the case. Um, and as business owners, we know we're not getting rich um, as, as financially to a level that our employees think we are by any means. Uh, but your biggest issue in a stage one business is going out and getting leads and figuring out how to market. And then stage two is going to be basically how do we create a sales machine? And that sales machine is how do we go out and predictably grow and scale the business while still getting the work done? The business owner is still traditionally in the field. So I'm going to circle back and, and, and put my spin or basically my opinion on where I think the sweet spot is, whether you're a solo operator or you're going to scale a large operation. And there's nothing wrong with either one of those. I'm going to kind of give you my insight now with two different businesses going to that uh, growth curve. But we've got stage one, stage two. Stage three now is we're starting to go out and build a team. So this is where most solo operators give up and throw the towel in. And I'm not going to sit here while I'm driving and sugarcoat it. This is a very, very stressful and tough part of any service business. Um, but stage three is we're going out and we're creating a sales system and marketing system alongside a team that can go out and replicate the work that the solo operator is doing, the business owner. And then stage four traditionally is going to be that million and mark and beyond and that's a whole different set of skill sets and issues you're going to run into. And at that stage four business, what you're really doing there now is you're trying to take the mission and vision and values, that core piece of that business that you can't really touch, but it's living. And you need to go out and create a leadership team that can continue to replicate the process and systems and those core values without the business owner. And then your stage five business is going to be somewhere probably that eight to $10 million mark where you're continuing to build that leadership team, but now you've multiple layers of that leadership team. And where part of the mission and the vision and that part of that business starts to erode because it's multiple layers away from the business owner. So now that we've kind of set the precedence of the five stages of business and where we're at, um, I'm gonna preface this that there's nothing wrong with being a solo operator. I will be honest, I actually really enjoyed the time I was on the truck um, by myself or with one or two employees. We were making pretty good money. Um, but there is a massive, massive disadvantage, and, and I don't necessarily think this is where I wanted to be, and I'll tell you, this is not where I wanted to be. Um, after a very long stretch of this between high school and college, um, I had the blessing of having enough employees and a team to have several crews on the road while I was full-time in college, uh, 40 credit hours and beyond. Um, but it was, an easy, it was a quick lesson that had to be learned that if I wanted to be able to go to school full-time, and after I got out of school, and got sucked back in working 100 hours a week, which ultimately caused a divorce in my life, which was not a good scene, that that wasn't a place I wanted to be. If I ever wanted to go on vacation, um, if I ever got hurt, the business would fall apart. So nothing wrong with being a solo operator, but I think there is too much risk, at least in my opinion, for the way I want to run a business, 
to be a solo operator. And I will tell you that things do get significantly easier between that 800 to a million mark or a little bit beyond that because now you've got process and systems. You've got a virtual bench and you've got backup employees. So if you're running the business financially sound, you should be in, in a hell of a lot better shape once you hit that 750 to a million beyond mark or maybe that 850 to a million beyond mark depending on the industry. Uh, but solo operator is great. Yes, there is some profits to be had there, but there's a lot of risk associated with that. And the risk is going to be is if you fall ill or you get hurt, there's no one to back you up. Your business has died. And going out to find subcontractors or someone to do the work for you for several months if you're injured is a real crapshoot. I've seen that happen in my market uh, with snow plowing. Uh, luckily, the local gentleman got a lot of help from the support group and the people on our Facebook page. But um, that gentleman, if he didn't find those people in the nick of time, probably would have been out of business. And he had built this business for you know eight, nine years, successful, profitable business. But the workload and the stress and the risk laid on his back, literally. And when his back went down, that business almost went down. So what I would suggest and encourage is we want to build a business that is scalable without us and get out of the field. And that stage three business where we're fine tuning the marketing and sales machine and building the team is where the stress happens. We need to build process and systems to create predictable systems. But once we can get over that growth hurdle, um, that's where the magic happens. That's when things start to get easier and things pull up. Um, and What's up, Bobby Follett? Buddy, I was actually just thinking about you. You got to hit me up with a PM later. Um, but anyways, the stage three business is where things are rough and most business owners get so frustrated that they go back and say, the hell with this. It's easier to be a solo operator because I was in control of everything. So if you can get past that stage three uh, hurdle in the beginning and get to that 750, 850 to a million mark and beyond. Once you get to a million, things loosen up and it becomes scalable. And when you lose an occasional customer or the occasional employee calls in sick or doesn't show, it's not as a traumatic situation. So where I'm gonna suggest that if you learn from my mistakes and where a lot of service businesses get hunkered down and lose momentum is in the beginning of that stage three, that 750 to a million mark. Once we get to a million or a little bit beyond, things become scalable. You have economies of scale. You have a leadership team. If you wanna leave for a week, you can. Vacation. Um, you wanna leave early for your kid's baseball game. Whatever that is, you wanna take a few days off. End of the, end of the season here, you may wanna go skiing. I don't, whatever that is to you, you can do that at that shift but you need to build predictable systems with accountability. And as we started to grow Callahan's quickly, we didn't have those accountability factors in place the way we should have in the beginning, and that led to even more stress. So as we're going in to this new season, the keys to get to that scalable business where you're not the owner-operator is we need to go out and build the virtual bench. So if you've ever heard Jonathan Potoshnik of The Lawn Care Millionaire or myself talk of these, about this process, um, either at an SA regional event or Facebook Live or a Lawn Care Millionaire video where we've talked about it, the virtual bench is going to be your saving grace. And what we want to do is go out and recruit for every position in the company, including your own, at least once a week, probably sometimes twice a week, but we are going to create accountability for our existing employees to let them know we are constantly recruiting for every position. And then when we need that new position, we already have it filled. So what we did in our business before we automated it was we ranked the applicants in an A, B, and C fashion with or without a driver's license and with any viewer's notes. We created a database and we could go in and search and say, I want all my applicants from the last, say, 20 days. What you got there is a glorified hiring checklist or basically a qualified labor pool. So when you have that employee that doesn't call in or calls in sick or just doesn't show up at all and you got a two-man crew and that one person has to work by themselves, that's when you're going to get blackmailed by your employee. They're going to say, well, I'll go out and do the work today, but I need a raise because I'm working by myself. Now, what you've done by allowing your staff to do that and not create your virtual events is you've put the power shift and the control 
in your employee's hands. And now if your employee is going to pull that move and basically blackmail you for a raise because they have to work by themselves that day, that's the wrong cultural fit. So that person needs to go as well as the person that didn't show up. But if you aren't constantly recruiting and creating that virtual bench or that qualified labor pool, you do not have the power. And I'm not on a pedestal preaching here because this is exactly what got us in trouble at Callahan's. Um, until we figured this out, life was absolutely miserable. Um, and that's the biggest hurdle for that stage three business to get to that million mark and beyond. But if we can create that virtual bench and let our employees know that we're constantly recruiting, so every once a month you stop down to the shop if you're not there on a daily basis. And I would say, hey, um, Paul, that's running the business, I'm going to be busy today because I'm doing interviews all day. And I set it right in front of the employees. And it, they're all kind of looking at each other going, well, wait a minute, we're fully staffed here. What's going on? We're not threatening them, but we're keeping them accountable and we're taking the power and shifting it back to the business owner and manager and creating a predictable system for hiring and onboarding. So that's the biggest thing you can take away from this, this, this video outside of where I think maybe you probably need to go and the risks and benefits of both is create that virtual bench. The labor market is absolutely brutal and I get it. And trust me, it doesn't matter the industry. Labor market's tight everywhere in every industry. So as we're going in, we're building that virtual bench. That's going to give you the power and the sanity to be able to continue to scale that solar operation to that stage three or stage four business. Um, and with that virtual bench, you start to get the power back. You get the freedom back. Uh, other question was stress. Yes, stress in a stage three business in the beginning can be absolutely brutal. But once you get over that hurdle, it loosens up and things get back to normal. And by the time you get to that million mark and beyond, you start to think, how in the hell did I survive that without this growth and scale? The thing I was worried about of all the stress and all the different trucks and equipment and employees is actually the thing that ends up freeing you because you start having multiple layers underneath you that guard you from getting sucked back on that cleaning crew or the mowing crew. So solar operators, I, I don't dislike it, but I also think that you're putting yourself at risk. If I was going to hedge a bet, just like I have with Callahan's and now Simple Growth, we're building a team. Simple Growth now is up to 10 full-time team members. And in that business, I used what I learned at Callahan's Lawn Care to systematically build that um, without any emotion. There was a roadmap before that was built, and now that business will scale. Uh, I'm definitely not an absentee owner in that business. I'm out making these videos, but now I'm more of the strategic piece, driving the business to where it's going um, to break that million mark and well beyond. And, and that is the scalable thing. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's lawn care or software or home cleaning. To build and scale a business from a solo operator to a business owner of a million and beyond, there's certain growth hurdles. And they're gonna be, how do we get all the leads in? How do we create a sales system how do we create an employee system now that we've got all this work? And now that we've got all those employees, how do we not become a full-time daycare as a business owner telling people what to do, when to do, and how to do it? And we call that repetitive tasks. So those are going to be your three main growth hurdles. Um, and once you figure out what they look like and how they feel, it's significantly easier to get past them. And then maybe the concerns of being a solo operator um, and going to a larger business are kind of alleviated because you know what that path is going to look like and when you see the growth hurdles coming you're able to overcome them and that was the biggest thing with simple growth the growth hurdles that we saw at Callahan's every five to six years maybe a little bit more I'm hitting those growth hurdles now every three to four months but I've seen them and what they look like and I know the pain points and the biggest one that you're going to face is labor 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 because once you figure out how to market and sell, the rest of it's pretty easy. But the labor part is tough. And that first step to that is building that virtual bench. Then we create a predictable onboarding and training system that doesn't revolve around the owner. So every time we hire a new employee, the owner or manager doesn't have to be there to, to manage it and babysit it. And then the following thing is once you've got a decent amount of employees, you need some kind of automation or system to tell people what to do, when to do, and how to do it. And if they don't do it, the automation notifies the person like, hey, Dave, you didn't do your job today. This is what you should have done. Let's get it done. 
and then the automation notifies the business owner or manager to pull a person in. So I think that is the biggest misconception of automations, or they call it email marketing. It really has nothing to do with email marketing. Um, we automate the sales via text, email, and phone call. We automate the employee recruiting, training, and onboarding. And then we automate our repetitive tasks, that third growth hurdle to get to a million and beyond and become uh, more of an absentee owner working on it and in it like Michael Gerber says. But the ability of automations is not to replace a person, but the automation itself is going to take you from that solo operator to that stage three or four business. And the automation there is going to help you alleviate the repetitive or tedious tasks. It's not all about removing and, and taking back a person. So automations at scale from a 750 to a million mark, um, it, we call it our sales level three package, is um, it'll do 35 to 40 hours of manual repetitive tasks if somebody in your office is physically doing it themselves. But I don't wanna replace that person in the office, I just wanna take the redundant repetitive tasks that they're doing and automate them and raise the ROI, the return on investment of that individual and get an exponential return out of them. And that's where we had the benefit at Callahan's that uh, Christine and Tammy in the office, if we had done this all without a process and a system and then eventually automating it, I would have needed three, maybe four individuals in that office full time. But Christine and Tammy uh, only working maybe three quarters time on a 40 hour work week, were able to accomplish the work of four people because we took the tedious and repetitive things that they would have had to done and they hate doing, and I hated managing, and the automation did it, and it allowed them to work on higher level um, things to provide better customer service. So, big question here, solo operator versus a larger scale operation. Solar operator, I loved my time being a solar operator, but I was not willing to deal with the risk. If I got hurt, I got sick, or I wanted to leave the business, the work didn't get done. So I think you're leaving yourself at major risk here. What I'm suggesting is go to that stage three or stage four business and just know that it's gonna be the, the basically the, the self-employment or the entrepreneur's gauntlet in the beginning of stage three. Be aware of it. But if you can proactively start doing things I'm talking about, building the virtual bench and creating process and systems, you should be able to exponentially blast past that. And that's exactly what we're doing at Simple Growth this year, our second year full time. Um, we're gonna blast past that growth hurdle and get to the, the far end of a uh, stage three business, so my second year full time. So I can tell you it can be done exponentially and basically hyper growth um, while still providing great customer service. But you need to know what the positions you're looking for are going to be in the future and start recruiting well in advance and that's the only way you're gonna blast past that. Otherwise, you're gonna get stuck in that rut of building a team and delegating, and eventually most people get so frustrated they get sucked back in to becoming a sole entrepreneur because they think it's going to be easier or they think it's going to be more profitable. Really, it's just seeing what that growth hurdle is and understanding what you need to do before you get there. So hopefully that helped uh, breaking it down, but my challenge to you is in the lawn care industry, let's become lawn mower and weed whacker free. If you're a solo operator, let's take some of these steps. I wanna hear some comments. What's your goals for 2020? Are you going to be lawn mower and weed whacker free? Um, we're working very tightly with Debbie Sardone in the home, or the home cleaning industry. Um, and she is an absolute uh, rock star figurehead, very similar to Jonathan uh, Potoshnik of the Lawn Care Millionaire. Debbie, in her own right, is the uh, home cleaning millionaire, let's just say. And uh, her, her saying is, let's become mop free. Um, and she has a thing called the 90 day challenge to become mop free in her cleaning business fundamentals. Uh, my challenge to you is if you're in the lawn care industry, are you willing to become lawn mower and weed whacker free? Um, so make a public commitment, put it down here. Let us know what kind of what stage of business you're at and where are you gonna be at the end of the year. And I'm gonna take some notes and uh, have, have a Facebook Live here mid-season and end of season um, and invite some of you folks that make comments here to see where you're at. So public accountability is usually the best way to get things going. Um, I'm publicly accounting and say, hey, we're gonna scale into that the farther end of a stage three business to simple growth this year because we're building the team and we've already pre-hired for the positions we're gonna need uh, as we scale into them. So. Comments, questions, drop below. I want to say what's up to Don Winters. Good seeing you guys down in Savannah. Uh, Mark Reimer, Bobby, Mike Rue, uh, Dave Long, Nick, 
Matt Harris, Eric, Gary, Jim, Spencer, and Ronnie, and Scott, uh, Chris Lund, Dave Nichols, Jim Morrison, and uh, Tracy. So I appreciate you guys watching. If you're still watching, now or recorded, drop your comments below. I want to know what stage business you're at and what are you going to do today and this quarter and next quarter to get to the stage of business you want. And if you are going to be a solo operator, nothing wrong with that. How are you going to build some safeguards in there if you get sick, you get hurt, or you want to take some vacation for a few days? How are we going to build a backup plan with subcontractors or some other mechanism that you are not putting yourself and your family at risk? So comments or questions drop below. Hopefully it was helpful. Stage one business, stage two business, solo operator. Don't hate it. Don't necessarily love it. I just think there's a lot of risk. But if that's where you're at and that's what you're doing, yes, you can make profits. The stress is going to be higher. The risk is going to be higher. Um, but you need to make some backup plans because you're, you're putting some risk in the, in the game. What I'm recommending is the profits, the stress, and the work-life balance are significantly better once you get to that million mark and beyond and you've built a team that can back you up. So until tomorrow, we'll see you live. Facebook Live, Mike Callahan, Simple Growth. And uh, Callahan's Corner is going to be coming up later today where you ask the questions. I answer them live on Facebook Live. We're going to be talking about mosquito packages and how to estimate them and how to set them up in Service Autopilot.